All right, we good? Okay, we're live, aren't we? Hey, everyone. Welcome to Security Gun Club here in Woodville, Washington. I'm William Kirk, president of Washington Gun Law. I got Kyle Metcalf, FFL, here at Security Gun Club. And I don't know, what do you want to talk about tonight? Is there anything going on in the uh, Second Amendment world that we should talk about tonight? Pretty important stuff. We got some braces. We got, yeah, we're going to have to, we need y'all guys to brace yourself here, okay? Brace yourself to piss yourself because we got a lot of things to talk about. Uh, now, listen, I know a lot of you guys, are, what I want to hear from you first is, is that we literally, this is on the fly. We set this thing up about 20, 30 minutes ago. Kyle and I tried to figure out what the hell we're going to talk about, but we need to make sure that this audio is coming in good. So if you could put some uh, things down in the comment section so our producer Tom here off the screen can make sure that you guys got good audio so you can hear what we got to talk about. Some of it may be important. I'm going to start with, um, I think, just let's give the words from the ATF, because I know what a lot of you are thinking right now, which is how the hell can the ATF flip-flop on that? And that was actually addressed on page 70 of this 292 page rule. I'm sure you geeked out on that today too, Kyle, but I think this is a good intro to what we wanna talk about today. So there was a lot of comments. As a matter of fact, I want you guys to first recognize that this is not gonna be all bad news. Uh, it's, it's predominantly bad news, but I think there's one that I want you guys all to take from this. And that is, is that, you know, when we take a look at the rule on frames and receivers, we take a look at all the comments that came in, we saw the rule move in the right direction. It's still a terrible rule, but it moved in the right direction. I think you and I can both agree because we were geeking out on the old rule a lot yeah. that the comments did make a little bit of a difference here. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say so. Okay. They took some input from us. They took a little bit of input, which is more than they normally take. But for many of you who had complained, like, how can ATF say for years and years and years that pistol braces are totally fine and now there's a problem with it? This is how the ATF responds to that. The department acknowledges that the variations of stabilizing braces design, the manufacturer's reported intent for brace devices, the changes in ATF's classification process, and the inconsistencies in ATF's analysis of braces attached to firearms may have led to confusion regarding the application of the NFA and the GCA to firearms equipped with purported stabilizing brace. The department agrees with commenters, including SB Tactical, that the analysis and some of ATF's prior opinions regarding incidental firing from the shoulder and the use of stabilizing braces on firearms have been inconsistent. That, I think, is an understatement. Agreed? Furthermore, as discussed below, ATF acknowledges that its classification issued between 2012 and 2020 did not properly or consistently evaluate whether firearms equipped with those devices were rifles as defined by both the National Firearm Act and the Gun Control Act. Specifically, ATF's analysis placed improper weight on whether the stabilizing brace at issue could be used as a brace to support single-handed fire rather than whether with overall configuration, the firearm with the attached brace is designed and intended to be fired from the shoulder as required by the statutory definition of the rule. Nevertheless, the department disagrees that any prior inconsistencies or changes by ATF make this rule arbitrary and capricious under the APA. Kyle, the APA is the, uh, the uh, American uh, Procedure Act. Did you know that? I, I know. Now I know. Well, we're, yeah. So the APA, <laughs> Professor McCurdy at Gonzaga, you'll appreciate this. The uh, American Procedures Act says it's a form of administrative law that basically says you're going to sue the government to either undo what they have done or about to or do, do to your client. So it's basically a way. And so what the argument here was is that, hey, listen, when you look at the, at the uh, Associated Procedures Act, okay, there is a particular way in which rules have to be implemented. And the ATF, by the way, never follows that. So what they also happen to say, just getting back to this real quick before we jump over here to Kyle here in a second, is that as discussed below, the prevalent shouldering of these firearms further demonstrates that a majority of firearms equipped with stabilizing braces currently or previously available on the market incorporate rifle characteristics. Therefore, it is necessary for the department to issue this rule to clarify the statutory definition of rifle and to inform the public of the best interpretation of the definition, which will guide the proper legal and factual analysis to be conducted in evaluating whether a firearm is designed, made, and intended to be fired from the shoulder as a result and to ensure consistency moving forward, ATF's prior classifications relating to stabilized braces is hereby null and void. 
So basically they're saying, hey, you know what? I know we were really inconsistent. I know we were all over the board, but you know what? Let's just forget all of that. Let's wipe the slate clean and we're going to start all over again. Is that what they're saying to yeah. us? Everything we did before, just disregard all that stuff. This is what's important now. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. So, you know, as, a, as an FFL, it is really critical for you guys to, as I put, scribble inside the lines all the time. What's it like when the lines are constantly getting moved on you? It's tough to track. Uh, that's that's the hardest part. You know, ATF's changing rules left and right and everything else. And, you know, given there's a lot of space in between, it takes forever to write up 296 pages. But if if they're changing things frequently, it's, you know, the law is one thing one day and you might be a criminal the next. So right. especially as an FFL holding a federal firearms license right. and multiple other things, we're relying on pieces of paper. If we break the law, you know, we, we got to watch it pretty, pretty close. Now, for those of you who have tried to geek out on this rule already, it is a whopping, what, 292 pages. We got it right here. We've had a chance to kind of skim through it. So uh, one of the reasons that we're not going to be taking questions live tonight, and I apologize for that, is, is because, one, the setup we have here is going to make it a little difficult. Uh, but number two, please do put questions because Kyle and I are going to go back. We're going to take a look at what questions we see repeatedly, and that's going to give us some topics for which we can do instructional videos later on to help you with that. So if we're not responding to your questions, does not mean we will not respond at some other time. Um, you and I had spent a lot of time geeking out on Form 4999. As a matter of fact, we even started shooting a video series that we decided to put on hold because we heard there was rumblings. You've had a chance to go through this rule. Tell me, in your impression, what you thought we were getting ourselves into compared to what we now have ourselves into, as you see it from an FFL. Yeah, so uh, we actually talked about it before all this set up, everything else. We, you know, we've got a guy who tracks Washington gun laws daily. I mean, you're spending most of your time doing that stuff. And Too much. Who's trying to follow those Washington laws all the time. I'm, I'm here doing my job. And... Even for you and I, there are so many inconsistencies and everything else between the point system and how to how to determine whether or not more points or less points or whatever it was was better or worse. And we we couldn't decipher what they were trying to say. So in a sense, getting rid of the forty nine ninety nine is a good thing. Yeah, but I would say in some other ways, and it's probably arguable for anybody, right? But they're just kind of putting out whatever information they want without any input from us too. So they're just taking the knowledge they think they know, or maybe some of them do, who knows? <laughs> right. I mean, we'll just... Well, we'll Kyle, and Kyle brings up a good point about the input, because if you geek out on this, you're going to see that there was about 292,000 comments on this rule. Yep. 272,000 of them were in opposition to this rule. So there was only 20,000 comments in favor of this rule. And you will see when you have an opportunity, for those of you who are going to have a hard time sleeping tonight, maybe want to read this whole thing, um, you will see that the ATF spends a great deal of time talking about all the comments in favor of the rule and very little time shooting down the hundreds of thousands of comments. But Kyle alluded to something really important. And I think that if you guys really want to take this new rule in a nutshell, okay, because what we're always trying to do here at Washington Gun Law is break it down into simple English so you can understand it. I think you and I both agree that if you just read pages 9, 10, and 11, it really kind of talks about, in essence, what this new rule does. Do you agree with yeah. that? Yeah, I'd say if you've got enough time, the first 15 to 20 pages really does give you the gist of what's going on here. But the ones you mentioned are definitely the most important of the bunch. Now, for those of you who have been geeking out with the channel for a while now, you know that both Kyle and I and myself in particular, we've spent a lot of time geeking out about Form 4999, this new four-point scale that we were getting all spun up about. And the big thing to come from the publication of this rule is what with the 4999? That's right. We not, aren't going to have that, that four-point scaling system on ATF Form 4999. However, and this is important, much of the criteria that we were seeing in that Form 4999 when we were going through it, we're seeing now being encapsulated into the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations yeah. now, right? Yeah, they implemented quite a bit of that. And so when we take a look at, and this is important, when we take a look at what the old rule looked like, and we take a look at what the new rule looks like, the, the purpose and the, the kind of the mantra behind it is still the same, which is this. Anything, and I want you to see if you agree with this. If you disagree, I want to hear it from you. Yeah. But anything in the configuration of that firearm, 
that suggest that that firearm is intended to be fired from the shoulder is getting us closer to the world of a rifle. And then for if we have a barrel less than 16 inches, we now have a short barrel rifle. Yeah, that's a matter of perspective. But I mean, yeah, anything getting closer and closer to rifles, why they're doing all of this stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I guess I can see, I can see some of the, the comments that come through with different braces and everything else going back and forth. And one's looking more and more like a buttstock and one's looking like a stabilizing brace. But realistically, they were all designed as stabilizing braces. What people do with them is dependent on the person shooting. But the fact of the matter is they weren't designed to be a buttstock. So this kind of, you know, I mean, we all expected it, but it throws you for a loop, right? Do you think though, over the course of time, you've been around firearms longer than I have, you're more familiar with firearms, but the, if you take a look at the earlier designs of the pistol braces, and then you take a look at the more modern designs, do you think that they have evolved using buttstocks as a design? Some of them, not all of them, obviously, but do you think some have? more than rifles have evolved i mean it's just like anything else computers evolve phones evolve and stuff like that so you're gonna have to make improvements to stuff and i don't think that it's evolved to a point where it's more like a rifle i just think it's a more effective brace yeah okay well let me let me share with you guys what atf said about form 49.99 while we're on that because uh, obviously this was an area that a lot of us were spun up on you and i had spent hours banging our head into the wall trying to figure this out and we couldn't figure it out, but the ATF, this is how they said, kind of deciding, hey, you know what? We're not gonna do this form 4999. After careful consideration of the comments received regarding the complexity and understanding proposed worksheet 4999, I don't know what complexity they're talking about there, and the methodology used in the worksheet to uh, evaluate firearms equipped with a brace device, the final rule does not adopt some of the aspects of, of the approach proposed in the notice of proposed rulemaking, specifically the worksheet 4999 and its point system. Now, when I read that, I was doing car throws, mm -hmm. but there's always a big however, isn't there? Always. Uh huh. Instead, based on the comments received, the department took the relevant criteria discussed in the proposed rulemaking and 4999 that indicate when a firearm is designed, made, or intended to be fired from the shoulder and incorporated them into the rules mm -hmm. Uh, revised definition of rifle. So what they have taken is if they have taken components of the 4999 and put it into the CFRs. You had something you wanted to add on that? Yeah. Yeah. So there was one key note there, the, the relevant information. So this from the 4999 being created to where they're at now, taking information, relevant information, mm -hmm. it's all happened in-house. So initially when we were talking about the 4999 stuff and going hours and hours into that, they already knew what the relevant information was. So I'm kind of curious as to why they didn't just take that relevant information in the first place and make a different sheet or I guess rework this somehow. Well, yeah. And I think, I, I think there's a lot of different things. I do think that the ATF may have bitten off a little bit more than they can chew here. I think so. that, I think that when they saw the comments coming in and, and obviously there was a lot of comments that were just, you know, the screaming shall not infringe. And I'm not, discrediting those comments, but a lot of times they'll respond to comments that have a little bit more thought to that. Um, and I think they did realize that they were they were probably biting off more than they could chew. I also think that when you take a look at like the West Virginia versus EPA case, if you take a look at this new bump stock uh, case that just came out of the Fifth Circuit, Cargill uh, v. Garland, um, I think the ATF probably paired it back and thinking that they were going to fit within the rule of law. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they got themselves there yet, though. So, yeah, because here's what else they say about Form 4999. He says, because both the Gun Control Act and the National Firearm Act define rifle as a weapon designed to be fired from the shoulder, the department believes that a weapon that is equipped with an accessory component or other rearward attachment that provides surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder is a rifle provided other factors described in the preamble and listed on the final regulatory text indicate the weapon is designed and be made or intended to be fired from the shoulder so am i hearing that what they're saying is is listen if it's got a pistol brace that's the start of the inquiry but then we're going to take a look at all this other criteria is that right yeah now if i also remember correctly when we were going through form 4999 there was a few prerequisites remember the video we oh, yeah. shot on the prerequisites there was yeah. a weight had to be a certain weight and less, less than a certain weight had to yep. be a certain length Yep. And of course, I always argue that if it doesn't have a stabilizing brace attached to it, then Form 4999 doesn't apply. You would think. One would think. Yeah. It was a form called Firearm with Attached Stabilizing Brace. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, let's go through these criteria because what they're saying here, and, I, and I, this is where I really want to get your input here, is I kind of want, you're going to see that there are kind of the big picture items that came from Form 4999 have now been encapsulated here into 27 CFR 478.11 and 479.11, Code of Federal Regulations, which actually further define statutory terms. Don't know why you need to define for, uh, further statutory terms when they're pretty clear, but here are the criteria that the ATF is looking for. Number one is whether the weapon has a weight or length consistent with the weight or length of similarly designed devices. This does get to our prerequisite, which was minimum of four pounds, right? Mm -hmm. And a maximum no longer than 26, 26. inches. 26 yeah. inches, right? So it had to be between 12 and 26 inches, mm -hmm. and it had to be at least four pounds. If it right. was less than four pounds, ATF was of the opinion you don't need a stabilizing brace. If it was less than 12 inches, ATF was that you don't need a stabilizing brace. If it was longer than 26, it was too long to be utilized as stabilizing right. brace, right? Yeah. Okay. And we have geeked out here at Security Gun Club. Washington's finest indoor shooting facility, by the way. But uh, uh, we've been geeking out around here, measuring, weighing firearms and things like that. And we realized what, when it came to the length and the weight of these firearms, that just about everything was going to fall into that, right? Yeah, almost everything across the board was above or uh, not compliant with the 49. Right. right. Okay. So we got the weight. Okay. So right away, I'm going to tell you folks that if your firearm is less than 12 inches, if it's longer than 26 inches, doesn't count. And that probably is a good point to talk about micro conversion kits because we anticipated that micro conversion kits were going to be outlawed by this rule. And I think when you go through the schematics and the diagrams that they got in this rule, I don't think there's any doubt in our mind that micro conversion, that we have seen the end of micro conversion kits. Yeah, I'd say so. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately. So yes. big sale at Security Gun Club. On, no, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> no, you guys, you guys don't say, sell those here. Okay, now, second criteria. Whether the weapon has a length of pull measured from the center of the trigger to the center of the shoulder stock or other rearward accessory component or attachment, including telescoping. So what, again, for a lot of our, they understand some things about what the hell is length of pull. So length of poles, exactly what they're saying as far as measurements, but what they don't describe there, at least what I haven't read yet, is where the collapsible stock is or if it's folding or whatever else. So there is there is differences between whether or not it's completely collapsed or fully extended. Okay. So I'd like to know. Okay. Yeah. All right. And do you recall what uh, – we do know that when we looked at the old Form 4999, we probably should have brought one of those with us, but it's kind of mildly irrelevant. But there was like half-inch increments would start racking up points. Yeah. So there's going to be a very little happy spot in there where ATF's going to be happy with the length of pole. And if it's a little too short, a little too long, yeah. they're going to have issues with it's that. Very specific. Yeah. Very specific. Okay. So we may end up having to do a video about the one firearm that actually complies with this rule. If we can yeah. find one. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm, I'm sure somewhere out there we can find it. Well, I think, I think the important thing to point out though, is, is that when you go in, like I say, if you want to get deep into this thing, when you start getting into the deep, deep pages, there's a lot of diagrams, there's a lot of things. ATF has also sent a lot of information to the FFLs that we're going to talk about also, but it is clear that there are some configurations of short, uh, of, of AR pistols with stabilizing braces that could theoretically still be deemed as AR pistols, not SBR. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I think there's also a chance. I mean, I haven't made it through the entire thing yet, but just from what I've read, I think there's a chance that they can go case by case as well. So there might be certain current pistols out there with somebody who does actually need that brace. And it might, if it was myself, they might qualify that as a SBR. And I think depending on the situation for the person, they might say, you know, maybe it's a, somebody who's in a wheelchair, they, right? They might say, because of your scenario, we're going to say that this is a pistol and allow them to have this. Well, wouldn't that be but nice if the, if the ATF took the ADA, one of the largest pieces of federal legislation <laughs> never designed to protect people and actually utilize it. Okay. Yeah. Third criteria is whether the weapon is equipped with sights or a scope with eye relief that require the weapon to be fired from the shoulder in order to be used as designed. Okay. So explain for our viewers what we're talking about there. So again, going over this just prior to this video, we were talking about um, a couple of different options as far as like a variable optic or something with just magnification. Just think anything that's uh, three by and more, um, that creates an eye relief uh, 
you'll see basically a black ring around it if you're not at the correct distance from the uh, the lens. And that I can understand where the ATF is coming from, but uh, we've got one bias, like just something you look through the glass. There's just a projected reticle inside of there. Right. That really doesn't matter how far away, how tall the site is, any of that stuff. It, there's no magnification. There's no uh, hindrance to your eyesight. So that should either way that could be looked at as a uh, assistant to the stabilizing brace and everything else. Iron mm -hmm. But that, but that type of optic there, an optic yeah. that can be used whether the arm is extended or the firearm is shoulders is the type of optic that people should be utilizing on their AR pistols. Because if it's the type of optic that is only usable when the firearm is much closer to the user by having it shoulder, right. that's going to be a big problem in the eyes of ATM, yeah, which is why they put that in there. That right. the way that they did, I would assume, but yeah, any non magnification should be visible. Your reticle should be visible from any distance away from your eye. So using a stabilizing brace, it would work. Now, here's the, here's the fourth criteria, because we're only halfway through the criteria. There are six criteria. So here's the fourth one. And this is one that we have talked a lot about. And we've actually looked at a bunch of braces. And that is whether the surface area that allows the weapon to be fired from the shoulder is created by a buffer tube, receiver extension, or any other accessory component or other rearward attachment that is necessary for the cycle of operations. What the hell does that mean? Well, there's one component that's necessary for the cycle of operations. That's the buffer tube and the internals of that buffer tube. Okay. Anything on the back of that, whether it's a stabilizing brace or whatever variation of stabilizing brace it is, or a fin, or yeah, you name it. We went over that yeah. before with the, right. the long videos, but. That's what they're talking about. The buffer tube is an essential piece of equipment on the gun. You need that part, but everything past that point. That's, so that's so if to. someone wanted to take an AR pistol and just take their brace off and shoot it in whatever fashion they wanted to without any attached stabilizing brace, just the buffer tube, do you right. see that this rule that does not even apply to that? Because the firearm's not designed to be fired from the shoulder at that point. Well, it's hard to tell you for sure. I'm not the lawyer here, but just my interpretation. Do, 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 do we get one? Do we get one around here? <laughs> So if my understanding is if a gun is born as, as a, a pistol, you know, like a MPX is out there, right. the AR pistols, whatever, if it comes with the stabilizing brace, it's categorized as such with the serial number. So that you can look up anybody can, well, not anybody, the departments that be can look up that serial number, see what it was made as. And then if it was a, a braced item, it's classified as such. But if it didn't have a brace when it was purchased or made or any of that, I would say that would be excluded from this. Okay. Okay. Now this is this is a the fifth criteria, and this is one that was not nowhere to be found on Form forty nine ninety nine, and this is one that's going to have some companies kicking themselves for what they may have done. The manufacturer's direct and indirect marketing and promotional materials indicating the intended use of the weapon. So let's, I'm going to just use SP Tactical as an example because they have sold millions of these braces and they make a good product. Yeah. Okay. If they have some ads from four or five years ago that show off their product by having people having firearms shouldered, is this the kind of thing that ATF's going to be jumping on and saying, hey man, back in 2018, you had this ad. Yeah. That's definitely guns and ammo about. that said, right? Yeah. I mean, so, we, we all, we do remember back when the initial, like, are you shouldering? Are you putting it on your bicep or your pec or right. your cheek weld with no connection to your torso? They're, like that whole thing is going on. So they're focusing in on some commercials yeah. or whatever. It so if we have any manufacturers of pistol braces uh, geeking out with us tonight, I would highly recommend that you sit down with your marketing team tomorrow and come up with a whole new marketing campaign that suggests <laughs> that firearm is never, ever meant to go to the shoulder, yep. right? Yep. Definitely. Moving forward, we are in the shoulder-free <laughs> brace company. Final one. Okay. And this is, and, and we saw this in Form 4999, and this is perhaps the most offensive thing. It's that catch-all like, okay, well, even if you do pass, we might still determine that it's a problem. Because the criteria six is information demonstrating the likely use of the weapon in the general community. What does that mean? Good question. Right? Yeah. Okay. But what I really do and what I'm really worried about with that is, is that that is that catch all that they could be like, okay, well, technically it doesn't meet the criteria, but you know, we've heard enough rumors of this thing being shouldered at ranges that we're going to just determine it to be an SBR. Sure. Okay. 
Um, here's what else the ATF says. It says if a firearm with an attached stabilizing brace meets the definition of a rifle based on the factors indicated in the final rule, then that firearm could also be a short barreled rifle depending on the length of the attached barrel, thus subjecting it to the NFA. However, a firearm with an attached brace device that is not a rifle is defined in the relevant statutes if it's not made to be fired from the shoulder. Okay, now here's the thing. Let's talk about all of these people out there who got braced firearms and they don't want to deal with this crap. I don't want to do it. And I know right now there's a probably producer Tom will tell us right now there's probably about 500 comments that said, I'm not going to comply. I'm not going to comply. Right. Okay. I get that. Listen, and one of the things about Washington gun law, I, we tell you where the rules and the laws are and how to scribble inside. If you choose to scribble outside, it's your life. You get to make that. It comes with a warning and we just tell you, hey, what can happen if you choose not to, all right? But what I wanna talk about is this, this whole um, thing with what you guys in your industry are gonna have to do now, because there are some things in this rule, we probably got some FFLs watching right now. Yeah. And just for your information, we probably should have started with this. This rule becomes effective 120 days from today's date. Okay, four months from now. That's when this rule goes into effect. However, I'm sure I'm going to stop you real quick. So yeah, I'm sure people are going to have the same question I do. It says from the publication date. Is today the publication date, or is it when it goes into the federal federal register? Today is the publication date. Okay, so 120 okay. days from today. Today's date. All right. However, for you guys in the FFL industry, the time clock is a little shorter, isn't it? Because it, it actually is. says that for if by chance the good folks here at security gun club had some firearms downstairs in retail that would now fall under sbr uh categories you have to do what and you have to do it by when so we have to either sell them to whoever would like to buy them and then initiate a form one before the 60 or 120 day mark for the individual but for the ffl we have 60 days to convert them over to what the NFA is saying is now the, for the SBR. Well, right. And here's the thing. Even if you guys, let's say there was a window of time within this 60 D window where you could transfer these things out without having to do an ATF form. It does not mean that the user and users, is not going to have to fill out an ATF form, right? They still will. Yeah, they still will. Yeah. Now I think this is a good segue because you, you and I were geeking out about this a little bit, but let's, let's get everyone kind of up to speed on the difference between a form four, and a form one. And then yeah. most importantly, I want to hear your expertise on what's the best way to do things and what's the most time efficient way of doing oh, stuff. I will theorize. You theorize based on what's happening today. But yeah. for our viewers, why don't you tell them the difference between a form one and a form four? Okay, so in simple ways, the form one is you as an individual and the owner of the firearm are manufacturing it into an NFA item. And a form four is the item is already an NFA, in the NFA registry, and then you are waiting for the ATF to give you the approval the same way you would any transaction for a firearm, except for the ATF has to do the background check. Differences being Form 1 currently, and probably not for long, are a heck of a lot quicker as where the Form 4, we all saw the 90 day mark that they talked about, and then it turned into seven, eight months, and everything else. It's supposed to be coming down, so you know, don't get too worried, but the Form 4s do take considerably longer than. The form four is take longer now. Yeah. Right now. Okay. So just so so we're understanding, it, it we're only doing a form four if we're buying the firearm as it as it Correct. sits coming off your shelf. Yeah. It constitutes an NFA item. Yeah. So then if I'm you're buying an SBR pre-made from yeah. the manufacturer, that is a form four item. Right. You're buying a pistol, and then once you get the approval, you take it home. It's yours, and then convert to an NFA item. Form one. Okay. And let's remember because we mess up on this. Mm -hmm. Converting a pistol to a rifle is okay, but going the other way, rifle to a pistol is not. I mean, it's different. Big category. no, no. It's a big different category. I mean, it's not uh, not as easy, I guess. Well, no, it's actually illegal, is what it is, because the statute says that we can a, a firearm which is made from a rifle with a barrel less than sixteen inches. Yeah, so we don't want to be converting. So, so before we get more deeper into the form ones and form fours. And we talked about this in our one of our videos, and ATF in this, and I should point this out, ATF has sent the fine folks at Security Gun Club and all of our FFLs around the state, uh, little help sheets here. We got the 
frequently asked questions, which we will go through. And then uh, we got this really nice presentation. I'm sure they're going to send ATF agents out and do this PowerPoint for all you guys I'm and sure. all of that. Yeah. Okay. To it. <laughs> but um, what do you envision being the uh, the most efficient way if someone is interested in trying to hang on to their pistol brace firearm how do you read this rule right now it's out they got 120 days to do something here, right right um i think the easiest way the, the best way to plan out for this is if you already have something like that is to try and remember best you can whether that came with the pistol brace or not if it did you're going to fall under that you need to form one within the 120 day mark so I, I recommend get those forms in as quickly as possible. Um, ATF is going to require a couple of things from you. You can look it all up on the ATF's website. You can call me, uh, 425-217-0800. You can ask for me. You can ask for SOAP. We've got a ton of people here that are very knowledgeable in the NFA world. But I would get form ones if you're going to do it that way. I would get those in as quickly as possible because you and the rest of the nation are going to be doing this at the same time and those rough 30-day timelines are going to turn into much longer pretty quickly right and and one of the things that the rule does make clear if you choose to comply and i get this is your own personal choice if you choose to comply with this rule and register the firearm there is no tax stamp that to be paid if you do it during the amnesty period that during the 120 days right supposedly supposedly <laughs> that's right they're saying no tax stamp okay now let here, here's the segue i wanted to talk about there if you have a brace pistol Mm -hmm. And you don't want to deal with this crap, but you want to also be one of those, I'm going to comply. Right. You can alter the fire. Mm -hmm. How can you alter the fire? So I'm going to give you the only answer, which is the legal answer. And you have to do it through the ATF Form 1. If you already have that pistol and you need to alter it over to the SBR to be compliant with the new rules that are coming out, you need to go through the Form 1 process. There's going to be a lot of the same stuff as the form one, but it's all going to be snail mail in. So you're actually going to send a package. But there's actually, there's actually, I'm sorry, that's probably a bad question on my part. So let me try this again. Sure. Is is that if I have a braced pistol mm -hmm. and I do not want to register, I'm one of these F that, I'm not registering this sure. pistol at all. I actually have three options. One is, is I can destroy the firearm. Yep. The other one's I can turn the firearm over to ATF. For destruction. For destruction, is it? Uh -huh. Or the third one is, is I can alter that firearm mm -hmm. so that it no longer falls under the purview of this rule, right? right. And that is adding a 16-inch barrel yep. or longer to the upper of that firearm. Yep. We can leave the, at that point, we can leave the stabilizing brakes there, or we could add a rifle stock because we're building a rifle from a pistol, which we can do. Right. It's going the other way that we get in big trouble, right. okay? Now... What's your, right now, if, if I come in and I'm going to do, let's say I brought in a firearm that I manufactured myself. And when I say, by the way, when I say manufacturing a firearm, I don't manufacture firearms. I assemble. Okay. Sure. I bought a completed lower. I bought a completed upper, a bolt carrier, some optics. I put it all together. It's an AR pistol. If I'm coming into security gun club and I'm like, hey, man, I need to do an amnesty registration on this thing. What's the process that people are going to be going through here? So we can walk you through uh Silencer shops actually changed a couple couple of times in the past couple of years. And forgive me, all the viewers, if I'm incorrect on my information, but the Form 1s previously, at least recently, were not being done through Silencer Shop or anything. You actually did that physically through the ATF account that you built. Um, I believe Silencer Shop is starting to do Form 1s, so if you need some assistance, feel free to give us a call. Uh, but you'll submit your Form 1. And you can do that from the convenience of your couch, as long as you've got a computer or a cell phone that can pull up the ATF's website. What kind of information is ATF going to be asking from individuals that need to fill out a Form 1? Beyond the obvious, you know, personal right. information, but what other kinds of information, especially as it relates to the schematics of the firearm itself? So as far as the Form 1 goes, they're going to ask for the, the detail of the firearm, the serial number, and some of the, the features of it, barrel length and stuff like that. Uh, I've informed one form one a, a firearm myself, so I'm speaking a little bit off of uh, some of my experiences here. Uh, but they're going to require some information about the gun. Uh, it's a lot of the similar information that you would have on like the 4473, just your your background, some of the answers. You know, are you a U.S. U.S. citizen, stuff like that. And then they're going to require. Have you ever denounced your government? Which today yeah. a lot of people are thinking about it, but don't do it. 
Don't do it because we'll have to answer that forty-four seventy-three the wrong way. Don't do it. Yeah, uh, they they will ask all the questions that you're going to answer on a normal firearm transaction, and then they're also going to require a fingerprint card. In fact, to them. A big, okay, and so to tell tell them our, our viewers out there how they go about getting their fingerprint card done. So fingerprint cards, from what I've collected recently, uh, any place that's doing passport photos, like say UPS has a passport photo place, you can go to UPS asking for fingerprint cards. Uh, they will even give you a digital copy, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but they'll give you a digital copy that you can use for future Form Ones. Uh, not that there's going to be a whole lot of that going forward. Right. Most Form Ones are turning it pistol into an SBR. So right. once we get through this big stretch, there will be less, but those digital copies will be helpful. Either way, you're going to need two hard copy fingerprint cards. All right. So Mr. FFL, I got a question for you here then. Boy. All right. Are you ready for this one? Okay. So if I was building a suppressor, yeah. I would use a form one. Mm -hmm. Let's say I compiled all the components to build the suppressor. I did my form one. I cannot do final assembly of that suppressor though, until I get my tax stamp and approval back. Correct. Correct. Okay. There now, is a, a tiny piece at the end of that as well. You also have to have it engraved. Engraved. So. Okay. Now we got all these people that are going to be sending in form ones mm -hmm. for short barrel rifles mm -hmm. that are already assembled. Mm -hmm. What gives? So, because I didn't see, I see the amnesty about, oh, you got this 120 day period, and hey, we're not going to charge you the $200 tax stamp. Right. But. Now, granted, with forty with with no forty nine ninety nine, we don't have to include all the photographs. But how do we know that the new revised form one's not going to ask for these photographs? Because there's been talk about that. There has been talk. They haven't said they're going to, and they haven't said they're not going to. So I don't know exactly what they're going to do. I'm kind of waiting for the next bit of news. Um, I do know that any AR pistol or similar, you know, any of the nine mil, whatever you name it, um, the serial number that's associated with the gun is associated with what the manufacturer did. So if you decide to form one, something that I haven't, again, I haven't read through this entire thing, but right. I haven't seen the note yet, is they haven't described after a form one about the engraving part. So there's hopefully a lot of people are watching this and they are uh, now being aware of the fact that there is an engraving that needs to happen to those lower receivers when you change it over to an SBR. So when you do that, Make sure to, if, if you're not in Washington State, contact whoever your local engraving place right. is. But if you're in Washington, come to me. I've got a service here where we can take your gun, probably get it turned around in like seven, eight days. But after that four months complete, you do need to have it engraved for it to be 100% compliant. Okay. And that's above and beyond any serialization that the manufacturer already put on. It's a separate serial number because right. you've just converted the, right. the first. So if I bought a, an AR rifle lower and I built my case, I would assemble an AR rifle, and now I'm like, you know, I'm going to drop a ten and a half inch barrel on that thing. Mm -hmm. That firearm's going to go get re-engraved. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So then, let me. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add on that? No, I think we covered it. Okay. So here's the other thing is, if, and I know right now, and I can kind of see in the distance all the comments that you guys aren't going to comply. I will not comply. That's fine. One of the doomsday scenarios that everybody always talks about is what happens if the ATF just decided to go round up all of these guys. Everybody who's got an AR pistol that didn't register after 120 days, we're sure. gonna come get them. Now, there is only certain number of firearms that there would be traceable data points on, isn't there? Yeah. Okay, so for example, if I buy, if I go downstairs here at Security Gun Club and I pick out a really, really nice AR pistol off the shelf there that's all, all the bells and whistles fully assembled. Mm -hmm. The data that goes on the 4473 is going to let ATF know I purchased an AR pistol, aren't, isn't it? Yeah, uh, the right? category is pistol. The ATF would have to do an audit to see that paperwork. It's not something that they just have digital copies or anything. But they have the right to do that, that audit whenever they want. They can check it whenever they want. That's, that's right. That's right. And because if, let's, let's say, it was a completed firearm, they would be the make, the model, the caliber. And anybody could look that up and say, hey, that was an AR pistol when right. it sold, right? Which means there's a data point saying this person has an AR pistol. Yeah. If we buy a completed AR rifle, it's also going to be recorded as an AR as a rifle, as a yeah. long gun, right? Yeah. So again, there's data for ATF to go back and figure out who might actually have a AR pistol. But 
the way I do it. This is the way I do it. I don't know why, but I have never purchased the completed uh, firearm in any AR platform. I have purchased a lot of lower receivers. Mm -hmm. I purchased a lot of upper receivers and I've done final assembly myself. There is no data point on any one of those firearms on my 4473s that say I have an AR pistol or an AR rifle, is no, there? It's a receiver. It's a receiver. Yeah. And the type of gun is another. Yep. Right? Yep. So uh, the moral of the story, folks, is if you're looking to uh, stock up and you wanted to do so in a completely legal manner, but a manner which provided the least amount of traceable data for a federal agency, if there was ever a federal law enforcement agency that would want to do that, the best way to do it is to buy lower receivers, buy separate upper receivers and do final assembly yourself. And, and, and for those who are not familiar, doing an assembly of a full lower receiver with a full upper takes about what, five seconds? Yeah, I'd say with the, including the YouTube video would take maybe 10 minutes. Totally, yeah, totally. yeah. Like 10 first, minutes, first time to, eight and a half minutes to watch it, one and a half minutes to figure out what you're doing and get it assembled. Yeah. Because it's two, it's just two pins, and then you drop in your bolt carrier group, and yeah. you're pretty much ready to roll. That, that's assuming that we've got a completed lower receiver. Right, a completed lower yeah. receiver. Right, yeah. Well, I'm not going to do a strip lower receiver, man. Oh, you're better. No, no, no. That's what you guys are for. I'm not going to do that, man. Come on. Come on. Okay, now, here's the other thing. If we don't register these firearms within the 120-day period, we are subjecting ourselves to... A felony, but this would be a situation where it's actually more normally if you possess an unlawful firearm under federal law, you're looking at five years in prison. However, if you're unlawfully possessing an NFA item, you're looking at 10 years. Okay. For those people out there that are saying, I'm not going to comply, I'm not going to comply, and I get where they're coming from. As an FFL, what would you say to folks like that? I understand where they're coming from, but we all know it's not the right choice. Uh, I do, as a gun owner, you know, aside from the gun club and everything else, I I have my own opinions as well. The whole uh, SBR registration, NFA stuff, you're putting your name on a list, they know where you're at and all that. My recommendation, realistically, as far as like keeping things legal, keeping yourself out of prison and everything else. Which is yeah. important. We kind of <laughs> preach that here at Washington Gun Law. Yeah, if you like your couch, don't go to yeah, prison. Right. So I, I would recommend uh, utilize the period that they've given us and, and just do the the Form 1 or the Form 4, whatever it is. Make sure that you get a, a legal NFA item. And then what I also tell people, especially like suppressors and stuff like that, people come in all the time and they're like, hey, I just bought a new suppressor. Buy a new safe for those NFA items too. Yeah. So the ATF can do a, a random search, no yes. warrant needed. They knock on your door and say, hey, we're in, here to inspect NFA items. Have two safes. They actually need a warrant for that. Do they? Yeah, they do. They good, do. Good news. They do. But <laughs> but I do encourage, I, 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 it's good advice, because if they did come in with a warrant, mm -hmm. their warrant would only be subject to search NFA items. So if you mm -hmm. had an NFA safe and non-NFA safe, yep. that warrant would only get them into one of those two safes. Yes, they are only Especially if all the NFA items that they expect to find there are all there. Yeah. You know, there's five NFA items. You pull five out of one safe. What the hell else do you need to look for? You already found the five things you're looking they for. They have a reason why they're there. They right. have a list of guns that you have. So right. if you've got a safe with five guns in it, they check those five guns. If you got another safe with 100 guns in it, they can't check them. They're not in the bank. Right. So Which, by the way, on a side note, that's why if you, uh, for those of you who want to do gun trust, you never put all your non-Title II firearms into your NFA gun trust so that the Schedule A can go back to ATF and they can see everything in your collection. Yeah tip of the day. Um, okay, now, this rule is going to go into effect in 120 days. Let me ask you this. From, from the FFL perspective, you guys have talked about it. What do you think is going to be the big change in the industry that we're going to see over the next couple of months as this rule gets closer and closer to implementation? So, I, a couple of different ideas. So, there's obviously the influx of people that are like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a free tax stamp out of this. I'm going to go buy all this stuff now and do the tax stamp stuff and be pretty stoked about free two hundred dollars too. Yeah, I mean, go out and spend two thousand dollars on a firearm and save yourself two hundred bucks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's going to be some people that uh, they don't care to add to their collection. They might, uh, they might wait. Honestly, they might wait to 118 days. And I don't know if that's right or wrong because I haven't read through the whole thing. But they could wait to 118 days, submit their application, and say, "I was within the 120 days." Correct me. I mean, if there's. Yeah, I think is that as long as listen. Here's what's going to happen: is is even if only. 20% of the people in the country who own these firearms decide to comply. 
Yeah. And that may be a pretty good estimate of what may happen here. Don't we think that the uh, Form 1 E system is going to break down under its weight? I, I mean, certainly think The thing blogged up, is, is clogged up all the time already. Yeah, the Form 4s are bad. The Form 1s, not quite as bad. But if we're talking about every single state that's allowed to have these guns and they're all submitting roughly at the same time, it's only 120 days. That's millions of applications. I guarantee it's going to bog the system. No, it's going to crash it. it. Yeah. Okay, so the, the other thing, and I kind of spaced this out, and I want to circle back on that. If we get this new amended uh, Form 1 that has photographs of the firearm that need to be attached, would you recommend that people disassemble the firearm and take the photograph with the upper and the lower detached and all of that? Because I don't like the fact that they haven't really given any amnesty to... Yeah. Right? I, I would... Personally, I would meet the minimum requirement. So if they're saying we need a photograph of the, the gun, the gun is the receiver. If they need a photograph of that gun with serial number attached and all that stuff, I'd just send them that. I wouldn't send them everything else. I wouldn't put my optic and my upper and everything else on there. I'd just send them what they need. You don't think that they're going to need to see the upper and take a look at the barrel lines on that, though, to determine? You don't know. Yeah. I mean, you can you can ask BR or lower without even having an upper right now. So why would they need to see the upper? You have not seen any rumblings whatsoever of a new Form 1 coming through at this point? Uh, very little, but I have seen uh, some updates to the Form 1 or some perspective updates. Okay. Okay. I guess we do need a picture. What's that? Pictures are always submitted with Form 1s. Big pictures are submitted with Form 1s? All right. Tom, the producer, tells us that. All right. Hey, listen. There's some frequently asked questions here. We're going to kind of wrap this up with some frequently asked questions. Now, these are frequently asked questions for Final Rule 2021-08F, brought to you by your Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, always a full-service operation that they are. But I do think that these are questions that many of you are going to commonly have. Now, again, am I saying these are my answers? No, I'm not saying these answers. I'm saying these are good answers. I'm not saying these are good answers either. I'm saying this is what ATF is saying. question is, is uh, the first question, what is the effect of the factoring criteria for firearms with attached stabilizing braces final rule? And basically says the rule outlines the factors ATF considers when evaluating firearms equipped with purported stabilizing braces. And it goes through all of the things. And it mentions many of the things that we're seeing in form 4999. Um, these, let me get into some of the more important questions. What happens if I have a firearm with a, a, a stabilizing brace that is an SVR? The answer here, according to the ATF, is the options available to you are further outlined in the question and answer below. One option is to render the SBR per the requirements of the NFA. The other two options, of course, Kyle, are destroy it or turn it into ATF, right? Destroy it or destroy it? Yeah, yeah. I am. Okay. Listing in on all this, but yeah, well, it's destroy it or destroy it. Well, here, why don't you, why don't you read ATF? question number three here? You jump in here and read question number three for our viewers. All right. Yeah. Question number three, if I choose to register a stabilizing brace equipped SBR, do I have to pay the NFA registration tax? What's the answer? The answer is no, provided you submit your NFA registration application to ATF within 120 days of the publication of the final rule today, see questions 13 and 14 below to additional information on the provisions of the final rule providing your tax forbearance on NFA registration applications. All right, so they say that as long as it's submitted within 120 days, not approved. There's going to be plenty of you that are not going to be approved in that 120 days. That's where that second option came into play. I think a lot of people are going to wait until those last couple of days, too. Yeah. yeah. They, they want to see if this is going to turn around. I mean, well, no, I no. I, I do think that there, and would it be wise for you to at least wait a 30 days? Yeah, because are the lawsuits uh, dropping tomorrow? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And you very well, with the EPA case, the West Virginia versus EPA case, and then this other case that we've geeked out a little bit on a couple of videos, this Cargill um, versus Garland case, the bump stock case, mm -hmm. there's a real question whether ATF can even be doing any of this stuff. What's the next question and answer for them here? Uh, number four is the, uh, does ATF have a list of specific, quote, braces that qualify in making a pistol into a short barreled rifle? Ooh, a list of actual braces. Just the mm. brace in and of itself is going to yeah. turn the firearm into a rifle. Wow. Oh, they didn't get that far into detail. No. The ATF regulates firearms as defined by the Gun Control Act of 1968 and National Firearms Act. And therefore, in general, ATF does not regulate accessories such as stabilizing braces. 
ATF will provide examples of both commercially available firearms sold with stabilizing braces and common weapon platforms equipped with stabilizing braces that are considered SBRs at their long website. Okay. So they don't they don't normally regulate accessories, is that right? Correct. Except unless it's a force reset trigger. Yeah. Have you seen a little we bit don't of, unless we do. We, we yeah. don't unless we do. Exactly. How do I get a determination if my brace device makes a pistol an SBR? Oh, a determination. Like I want to voluntarily get ATF's opinion on that. What do you think? That's a good idea. In addition to ATF's list of commercially available firearms sold with stabilizing braces and other common weapon platforms equipped with stabilizing braces that qualify as SBRs, any other firearms equipped with stabilizing brace or rearward attachment may be submitted to ATF's Firearm and Ammunition Technology Division for classification. Mm -hmm. Wow, did you know that? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> And uh, the address is in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and I'm not even going to bother to put it online. Now, I will say one thing, and I did notice this when I was geeking out on the rule. If we are submitting a sample and the ATF said that particular firearm is good, that determination applies only to that exact firearm. You could sit there and you could say, oh, then all firearms of this make and model are no. It's not right. because there can be changes in the configuration of every little firearm that right. can alter it. So right. understand if for whatever reason you submit a firearm for ATF determination to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and you get a, you get a thumbs up, that's good for that one firearm. Okay. Um, listen, why don't you take a look? Why don't you tell everyone what the questions six and seven are real quick there? Uh, you want me to read the questions? Yeah, read the questions included? so they know what they're going. Yeah, question and answer so they know what's going on. Right. So we got number six, which is what are the compliance options for an individual non-licensee in possession of a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace, which is a short-barreled rifle, after the effective date of the final rule? So this is what what can you do if all of a sudden, crap, I got an SBR. What can I do? Well, you can submit through the e-form system an application to make and register a firearm, ATF Form 1, e-form one within 120 days of the date of publication of the federal register you can permanently remove or alter the stabilizing brace so that it cannot be reattached and thereby removing it from regulation as a firearm under the nfa you can remove the short barrel and attach a 16 inch or longer rifle barrel to the firearm thus removing it from the provisions of the nfa you can turn the firearm into your local atf office and you can destroy the firearm oh. Now, I got a question about the, um, you can remove the pistol brace and then make it so it can't be reattached. How does a person make it? Because you said that's a buffer tube there. And you yeah. said that's essential to the cycle of operations. So how can we make it so that it can't be reattached uh, well, without screwing up the buffer tube? For for those of us handy people, you can take a grinder and cut the that little channel where the brace will lock into different settings you can just grind that down flat you can change out the tube for just a round two but that would only adjustment. mean that the brace would lock in place it could still slide on there and granted you'd always be in the most forward position sure. but yeah and then fall off if you decide to take the gun away from your body you know there could be a proprietary uh thing for uh, buffer tubes that are a little bit more in diameter that doesn't fit mm -hmm. any of the pistol braces there are those out there too that's probably my question is that they've also got uh They've got a C-clamp style stabilizing brace too. So there's no permanent alteration to a buffer tube. You, there's always, or at least right now, there's an option for attaching something all of them. And, and to be clear, Darn the removal wrong. of the buffer tube and therefore out goes the buffer spring means yeah. the firearm's not going to function at that point, right? It's not right. going to function the way it's designed. <laughs> you can't take the buffer tube off. Yeah, it's not going to happen. That to yeah. What's question seven? Seven, what are the... Compliance options for an FFL non SOT in possession of a firearm equipped with a stabilizing brace, which is an SBR after the effective date of the final rule. Submitted through eForms system, an application to make and register a firearm, eForm 1, within 120 days from the date of publication in the Federal Register. But this is for an FFL. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. say that based upon what we read in this rule, they should do that within 60 days. Well, they're saying something different here. I know. <laughs> Uh, option number two, permanently remove or alter the stabilizing brace so that it cannot be reattached, thereby removing it from the regulation as a firearm under the NFA. 
you can remove the short barrel and attach a 16 inch or longer rifle barrel to the firearm, thus removing it from the provisions of the NFA, or turn the firearm into your local ATF office. And then there's this last option right here, too, which is destroy the firearm. So, for those of you who want to destroy your firearm, you have that option. Uh, right. What are the compliance options for an FFL LCT holder in possession of firearms equipped with stabilized braces, which is an SBR, after the effective date of the final rule? That's again really for you guys, but again, you're basically the same option register, alter, destroy, or turn in. Those are really your options. Uh, what are the compliance options for government entities in possession of firearms? Well, government entities. So you have a couple of extra options as it relates to ATF forms because you can register them as government entities. But beyond that, they're stuck with the same options again. Once the firearm is registered as a short barrel rifle, can I remove, change the stabilizing brace or attach an item marked as a stock? If so, am I required to notify the ATF in advance? Ooh, this is a good question. If you're gonna make me register this as an SBR, why don't I just turn the damn thing into an SBR? Can they do that? I would. I would too. The answer, by the way, according to our good folks at the ATF is yes. The firearm is registered in an SBR, and you can change out the brace device or a stock for a different brace or stock. You do not need to contact the ATF because it is already an NFA item. Well, regardless of what the gun is, everybody knows it's more comfortable to shoot with a butt stock than it is an arm brace, which you know we can argue all day long with this. Now, this is really important. If you have an NFA item and you're going to change the rearward accessory. From a brace to a stock, you do not need to notify ATF. However, if you have an SBR and you change the barrel length, according to here, you do need to notify ATF. Right. So if you got a 10 and a half inch barrel with a pistol brace and you decide to register it, and you're like, well, the hell with it. I'm going to go ahead and throw on a rifle stock. And now since I got a rifle stock, I'll drop a seven and a half inch barrel on there. You need to notify the ATF of the barrel change. Change the configuration of Right, right. Okay. If I no longer want an SBR and I remove the brace, do I need to contact the NFA to unregister my SBR? Wow, I didn't know that. It's not a requirement to remove your SBR from the NFPR, however. ATF highly recommends you notify the government when you decide to remove an item from it, from the NFA. I would do it too, because why would you want to be sitting under federal scrutiny that you don't need to be under? I don't. There's rules about crossing over state lines and everything else. If you're going to change your gun back over to something that's not an NFA item, or if you're going to physically change the gun, you should legally change the gun too, because then you can, right, according to whatever right. laws are present, you can travel with it. Listen, I've, I've resisted doing uh, videos on this because I really don't want my phone to blow up, but I may be stuck here because this is a really good question and it's something people should think about now. Okay. Can I register my firearm with a stabilizing brace to my gun trust? The answer now is yes, you can because it's an NFA item. Okay. And uh, yes, however, the firearm would have needed to be owned by the trust prior to the date the final rule is published in the Federal Register. Evidence that the firearm was in trust should be provided with the registration document. If you have a NFA gun trust and you decide to do a Form 1 amnesty registration, yes, you can actually roll that firearm into the NFA trust. Did I hear you correctly when you said it has to already be on the trust? Though? No, it has to already be in there because that has to be owned by the data. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. So there could be more reasons for gun trust. I will tell you real quick on a side note. Gun trust lawyers will always tell you that you need a freaking gun trust every single time. And when I talk to people, we actually find out that about half the people that I talk to don't need a gun trust. They only want a gun trust. I just want them to know which one they are. Okay. Is there a limit of how many firearms with a stabilizing brace that I can register as SBRs free during the tax period? Ooh, how generous is Uncle Sam going to be? The, the tax forbearance only pertains to the firearms with attached stabilizing brace in your possession at the time the final rule is published. There is no limit on how many you may register, but owners in possession of these SBRs must register within 120 days. So if you got 15 of these firearms that fit into this category, yeah, you can do it. Now, if you try to slide in a couple of other suppressors and short barrel, you know, sure. shotguns on it, you're probably going to be called on it. If my SBR is made after the date of publication of the final rule. Can I still register it as an SBR for free during the tax forbearance period? No. 
The answer is no. If I attach my stabilizing brace on a rifle with a 16 inch barrel, will the firearm fall within the purview of the NFA? First question is why the hell would you do that? Okay, you agree? From a configuration standpoint, not the best thing to do. The answer is no. No, you got a rifle already. You got a firearm with a 16 inch barrel. So you're not, you're not gonna be dealing in any type of short barrel. We're wrapping this up here in a few minutes. Can I legally sell my stabilizing brace to someone who may be interested in making a short barrel rifle even after the tax forbearance period terminates. Check this out. They say ATF does not regulate the sale of firearm accessories. <laughs> Ask the folks over at Rare Breed, Big Daddy Unlimited, yeah, they they'll fire it. trigger if they regulate firearm accessories. So um, those are kind of some of the, there's a lot more questions, but we don't want to keep you guys on line all night. But those were some of the more commonly asked questions. Now, listen, I'm going to turn over to Kyle here in just a second. But again, I want you guys to put your comments down below. I'm sorry we can't respond to them tonight. But again, we're going to be looking at these comments. Uh, I got a whole weekend, got a three-day weekend in front of us. We can shoot some extra videos and get you up to speed. Your impression, because we call, you called me this afternoon, said, oh, crap, this rule drop. You hadn't even read it yet. I pulled it up. We started reading it. Your initial impression? Not so great for yeah. the gun community. Like, just to sum it up there. It's not not awesome. No, right? a lot of us have stuff that we're now being forced into a federal registry. Yeah, I agree. I think that the ATF streamlined the process considerably, but I think they streamlined it for them and their enforcement efforts. I think that when you take a look at the spirit of the old rule and the form forty nine ninety nine, and realize that they just took most of the critical components and encapsulated into the CFRs. Um, it's really just kind of rearranging the deck furniture on the Titanic here a little bit. Now, I think in some ways, though, that what the ATF has done for a legal argument, when we make this argument all the time about, hey, listen, the ATF is an executive agency. They don't have the right to legislate. They don't have the right to make laws, all of which, by the way, is true, that their actions here may actually uh, make those arguments a little bit stronger. So I'm sure that the lawsuits are warming up right now. Pete Serrano is probably right now working on that brief as well. So um, do you have any other comments that you want to drop to our viewers before we yeah. call it a night? So for the time being, until something changes, if it ever does change, um, do, do what you think is best for your family. I'm not telling you don't do it. I'm not telling you do do it. But if you want to be legally compliant, you should probably start looking into this E-Form 1 for any of the guns that you currently own. If you are trying to get any of our uh, any of the pistols on the shelf and do an e-form one for something that you have been wanting for a while get that going as well um do do the paperwork get your tax stamp get the engraving all done if you need help with the engravings come into us we can take care of stuff for you we've got services all over the place the gun community is a big one so use your resources we're happy to help you out answer questions where we can we are not lawyers here but we do have a really good guy to reference to so Give us a call. Stop in. Anything that you need, we're here to help. Listen, I just want to close with these comments. I realize that all of you are frustrated, especially my Washington viewers, because not only are we getting kicked in the shins by the federal government, we're also getting punched in the groin by our state government right now, too. And I get that. And you want to just scream at the top of your lungs, I will not comply. I will not comply. And again, I have never at Washington Gun Law ever wanted to tell any of you how you should think about things. I give you enough objective information, you can make that decision. But let us not forget that one of the core principles of Washington gun law is that we preach on being the lawful and responsible gun owner. And we may not like the laws, and there is a time and a way to fight those laws. And I just ask all of you to take very careful consideration to your family and to all the other people who depend on you and realize what hills are worth dying on and what aren't, okay? Ultimately, you get to make that decision, but lawful and responsible gun ownership is critical to the advancement of the Second Amendment rights. Listen, we'll get some more videos done this weekend so that you guys can get up to speed. Uh, there'll be plenty of other videos out there. And, I, and again, I really, really wanna caution you guys. There's some people out here on the YouTube reverse. I think they're very, very entertaining, but they spend a lot of time spinning you up and trying to get you, tell you how to think about things. Find the people who are giving you objective information. You're all big boys and girls yourself. You can figure this out for yourself. You know how to think. In the meantime, I want you all guys to remember that, listen, part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time, Kyle and I talk about this stuff all the time, is to know what the law is in every situation 
and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. We'll get videos out. In the meantime, all you guys keep fighting. Most importantly, stay safe.